the live stream, uh, it's gonna. Uh, Paula, I've shared the uh, YouTube ID with you, so. I can see it now, thank you. I'm going to uh, code the web page so we can embed the, the live stream. And we're gonna have a 20 second delay, just so whatever you say, you know, and you have family and friends watching from home, they're gonna hear it 20 seconds later. I I'll let you know when everything's ready. Okay, we're live on the website now. Okay, so we have about two more minutes before three minute thesis will begin. Um, so we'll hold tight and we'll get started just around four. Thanks. Katie, are we live? Yes, we are. Good. Paul, welcome. Nice. Thanks, nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you too. So this is our live streaming experiment. Um, we've just started. We've just started streaming on the 3MT website. Well, then I'm going to ask how how to pronounce your last name. Iam. One more time. Iam. M. Okay, I can do that. Yes. But, but if you get, it's easy to get close. <laughs> In fact, <laughs> I think I'm not even sure I pronounce it properly. <laughs> I will pronounce it however you prefer, or at least I'll try. I haven't quite got my Long Island accent down yet. Fantastic. So let's see, we are just about ready to go.
Okay, Paul, I'm going to turn, let, let's turn off your camera and your microphone for the moment. That's the one thing about the live stream is it picks up whoever is currently live or is currently sounding. Awesome. And then I will introduce you in just a moment. So I, I think we are just about ready. Um, I think the live stream is going. I think that all of our competitors are here. I'm going to stop sharing my slide. All right, it's 4.01. This is about as close to crack timing as I think we can get. So uh, so welcome to everyone. Welcome to everyone out in, in Cyberland um, who hopefully has gotten a chance to uh, tune in to the live stream of our three minute thesis competition today. Our three minute thesis competition final round um, because three minute thesis has actually already been going on for quite a few weeks. Um, so I'm Kathleen Flint M, uh, Assistant Dean for Graduate and Postdoctoral Initiatives in the Graduate School. And I am just delighted to introduce you all and just welcome you to uh, a three minute thesis for 2021. Um, three minute thesis or, or 3MT for short is, is sort of become our, our signature event. And it's really one of our most favorite things that we do every year. Um, our, our graduate students are phenomenal as you'll all see in a moment. Um, they put so much hard work into this, and we really hope that um, the work that they've done is going to end up having huge ripple effects into the rest of their scholarship and their careers uh, going forward in this, because they've really been, really been putting the shine on their communication skills. Um, so we've been holding the three-minute thesis competition in this form annually now since about 2007, or excuse me, 2017. Uh, it's a collaboration between the Graduate School and uh, Dr. Alfreda James from the Career Center and the Graduate Student Organization, um, which was uh, led this year by Alexia Cosby, who's a PhD student in chemistry and the vice president of the GSO. And uh, we are you know, delighted to also call um, another partner, the uh, Stony Brook Alumni Association, who has graciously supported the prizes for 3MT for the last number of years and uh, is a really valuable partner for us. So we couldn't do 3MT without all of these groups. So I wanted to do a huge shout out there. Um, and then now I would like to turn the floor over to, I'm, I'm just, I'm delighted to introduce to all of you our new provost. Um, Paul Gobart is our provost and executive vice president for academic affairs and has just joined us, I think, maybe a month or two ago. Um, and so welcome, Paul, and please uh, have a moment to give us a few remarks. Well, thank you very much indeed. Uh, uh, welcome, everybody. As Katie said, I'm Paul Goldbart. I arrived a month or so ago as Stony Brook's new provost. And it's really great to be with you for this uh, absolutely terrific event. Um, many things attracted me to Stony Brook, uh, prominent amongst them, is our community's core commitment to communicating research, not just well, but brilliantly. And we're so fortunate to have the Alan Alder Center as our guide and inspiration for doing this. I see at least three reasons why this all matters. One is personal, the joy of sharing the intense relationship we have with our research. As Carl Sagan, himself a pioneer in communicating research, wrote of his own field, not explaining science, in his case, not explaining science seems perverse. When you're in love, you want to tell the world. Well, another reason is connecting. Surely a key way to restore and invigorate public commitment to institutions like ours, which deliver so much good to the world, is to excite people with clear, compelling stories about the mountains we climb and the views we deliver from their summits. And third, don't we owe it to the people who invest in us to tell them about what we've accomplished in a comprehensible and authentic way? Minute number two, some thanks to Graduate School Assistant Dean Katie Flint M for putting on the event, to our event sponsors, the Graduate School, the Career Center, the Graduate Student Organization and the Alumni Association, which provides the awards for the winners. And let me also welcome and thank for those awards, Robert De Brower, president of the board of the Alumni Association, who's joining us this afternoon. Minute number three, what's on the program? Well, previously, in round one, we had 26 participants from a range of fields, biology, chemistry, computer science, engineering, English, marine and atmospheric science. Tonight, we have the eight finalists. 
Sharing research for non-specialists efficiently is a particular skill and one that isn't commonly taught. It requires bravery and discipline. Our speakers are taking thousands of hours of their work and distilling it into 180 seconds, less time than it takes to boil an egg. It's hard work, even for scholars who live and breathe challenges, grant proposals, failed experiments, corrupted data, paper writing, and more. Distilling research down and showing its relevance isn't straightforward. Yet it's vital for researchers and for society. The skills our presenters have learned is certain to help them in their careers. I understand that some have already earned themselves job offers using elements of their presentations. But these skills will also help, help the rest of us because we shall be able to understand and engage with new information and its significance in our worlds. Thank you for letting me join you. I'm excited to hear about what our speakers have to say and to learn how I can do it better myself. Thank you. Oh, great. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, so I wanted to give just a, a quick shout out as well to the graduate dean, Eric Wertheimer. Um, Eric, would you like to say a quick hello? Can you hear me now? Yes, you can hear me. Uh, hi, all. I am supposed to be on vacation today, but um, I could not resist this event. Uh, and I'm so excited to hear uh, and see uh, your work. And I know uh, it's a great tribute both to your efforts and to the efforts of uh, Assistant Dean KDM and Jen Green and all of the folks uh, who, have, who have worked with you and side by side uh, with the staff to pull this off. Uh, it's truly exciting. Uh, it really is at the, at the core of the kinds of things we're trying to build at Stony Brook in the graduate school. Uh, and I believe as well that uh, Provost Goldbart shares that and, and that's extremely exciting for us as well. So thank you, good luck and, uh, and looking forward to it. Great, thanks so much, Eric. Um, so, so, so let's go ahead and, and, and get into it. So I, I'm gonna give you a little bit of an overview of you know, what is three minute thesis, uh, what are the rules? What are we going to be doing and expecting today? Um, and the, the first thing I want to emphasize about three minute thesis here at Stony Brook is that it's all about professional development for us that yes, three minute thesis is technically a competition and we're extremely grateful to be able to give out prizes for all the hard work that our top speakers have put in over the last couple of weeks. But at the end of the day, and, and I, I say this every year, and you're probably gonna see me tear up at some point, but honestly, all of our speakers and all of our competitors are winners in the sense that they've put in so much hard work, they put together fantastic talks. They've really been focusing on the bottom line, which is developing their research communication skills so that they can talk about the important work that they've done here at Stony Brook to, to basically any audience. So that could include you know, going home and talking to their family, talking to their congressperson about funding, um, talking to their dean or their search committee in order to get that next job. And so these are going to be really critical skills no matter where they go in their careers from, from here on forward. Um, and of course, you know, those skills are even more critical in a virtual setting, something I think we've all experienced now over the past year during the pandemic. Um, and, and I think it's going to be a skill that we're, we're all going to have to take into the future as well, given the nature of the hybrid virtual interactions we're all probably going to have, the talks we'll be giving at conferences, uh, the virtual interviews and, um, and other types of interactions that we might do as part of getting our jobs as well. Um, and so, Because professional development is really the key part, that's the part that we do a little bit differently at Stony Brook. Um, if we wanna to try to enhance professional development, we've decided to actually provide training individualized coaching to all of the competitors who have been um, working on their talks now for weeks and weeks. 
And the goal of those talks is to really distill down to the heart of the work that they've done and find a way that they can connect with anyone about the work that they've done. So, uh, so to, a way to connect with me or to any one of you who are in the audience right now. And you'll all be able to be the judge of that in just a moment when you get a chance to see their live talks. Um, we also have a panel of judges who will be evaluating the best talks and helping us award the prizes. And then you, the audience, are going to have the opportunity to vote for your favorite as well as part of the people's choice. And so we'll talk about how to do that after all the talks finish in just a little while. Um, but first, just a few words about the rules and what to expect. So the thing about three minute thesis is that your talk can only be three minutes and you can only have one slide and that slide has to be static. No, no sound, no music, no animations. Um, it's also only spoken words, so no, unfortunately, perhaps, no poems, no raps, no songs. Um, the important thing about the three minute limit and something you may or may not see, um, all of our talks, all of our speakers have worked very hard to get their talks into this perfect three minute window. If they do come close to that three minute limit, what our rule is, is that they can finish their last sentence when they get to three minutes and then they need to stop. But if they do keep going past that limit, then we will consider that having violated the three minute limit and they'll be disqualified. Uh, the criteria that our students are going to be evaluated on in some sense are very simple. It's two primary criteria, comprehension and content, they get 10 points and engagement and communication. The idea is a number one, comprehension and content. Did they tell us what they did, why they did it and what they learned from it? Um, for engagement and communication, you know, did they engage the audience? Did they use language or approaches or techniques to really help connect with all of us? Was their slide useful? Um, and so based on those, we will be uh, determining our winners at the end of the event. Um, I wanted to do a quick uh, shout out to the many, many judges who have participated in this over both round one and round two. Um, thank you all for all of the effort that you've put into this event. Um, also a quick thank you to um, our leadership team, which continues to grow each year from the graduate school, from the GSO and from the Career Center. Uh, thank you all for your help and your support. Um, and then of course, you know, our, our sponsors who help make this thing happen, the SBU Alumni Association, GSO, Career Center, our graduate and postdoctoral professional development, that's my unit. Um, and a quick shout out to the fact that the 3MT model actually was developed at the University of Queensland and they uh, kindly shared it with the world. And I think that it's really taken us all by storm. Um, so I'm going to end there. And I'm now going to introduce Alexia Cosby again, uh, Vice President of the GSO. And Alexia will take us into the talks. Hi everyone, I am Alexia Cosby. I am a chemistry PhD and the GSO Vice President. And um, it really great, gives me great joy to see all of the eight finalists here and then all of the other competitors of the three minute thesis competition. Uh, you know, this year has been tough. It has been really, really tough. And so I just want to commend all of you for uh, just, you know, finding the energy to participate in this competition and finding the energy, energy to keep pushing through. And I, I really cannot wait to hear all of your talks. Um, I'm truly very excited and very honored. So with that, I would like to remind our audience that we have, in addition to those three prizes determined by the judges, there's also the People's Choice Award. So just be thinking about who your favorite talk is. And at the very end of all eight, we will open up a link for you to vote for your favorite, your absolute favorite. So to get this started, our very first speaker is Vidushi Sharma. So Vidushi, if you'd like to go ahead and share your slide. Uh, judges, if you'd like to find Vidushi and pin her on your screen, as well as the three minute thesis timer, uh, we can do that. And judges, just let me know if, if we're going too quick, just, uh, just chime in. Okay, so I am, very pleased to present Vidushi Sharma, who is from the physics program, and her talk is Learning to Thrive with Dihydrogen Monoxide. Go ahead. Water is the matrix of life. 
the signs of which makes life as we know it exist and thrive on planet Earth. And yet it remains at the center of many open puzzles in science. Now imagine this, when light of sufficiently high energy hits a water molecule, it splits it, dislodging an electron from its structure. Sounds like a really cool tabletop experiment, right? Just slicing a water molecule. But scientists from various fields are still scratching their heads as to how this process is set off exactly. The reason, well, to begin with, it is too fast and too tiny, even for the most sophisticated experiments. My research focuses on modeling and understanding some of the most fundamental ultra-fast processes occurring in water on a time scale that is one quadrillionth of a second. That means one millionth of one billionth of a second. When we go down to such small time scales, it is important to account for the behavior of the subatomic particles like electrons and protons. A mathematical approximation is that the electrons are so light that their motion can be entirely decoupled from the movement of the much heavier nuclei. However, we explore the curiosity of what if we let the electrons talk to the nuclei? How would this two-way communication affect both the particles and their trajectories? To understand this, we turn to a model system of a few water molecules that undergo a rapid transfer of protons when excited with UV pulses. In fact, such a phenomenon has been known to occur in Earth's upper atmosphere dating all the way back to the 80s. This may be a tough process to replicate and analyze in a lab environment due to the really tiny timescales involved. However, we record a computational movie directed by the principles of physics showing how an electronic excitation ionizes a water cluster, spurring a cascade of proton hop events. It is like watching a game of musical chairs, but with protons. While this phenomenon may be relevant higher up in the atmosphere, Coming back closer to land, one can employ the same computational physics tools to now split water to produce clean hydrogen fuel. The idea behind this is to mimic a natural photosynthesis type process to generate sustainable solar fuels from water utilizing just the abundantly available solar energy. What we must not forget is to break that water molecule in the most efficient way possible. Thank you. That was excellent, Fadushi. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so judges, I'll give you a quick quick second here, just as a break. And um, then in the meantime, our next speaker is going to be Amanda Russo. She's from the Integrative Neuroscience, um, studies Integrative Neuroscience in the Psychology Department. And today her talk is on getting rid of traumatic memories. Take it away, Amanda. Post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD is a debilitating condition which occurs in some people who experience trauma, such as active combat, being in a car accident, assault, loss of a loved one, and more. And people who are afflicted with this condition relive the traumatic memories over and over again. To briefly highlight the impact of PTSD on society, approximately 7% of Americans will develop PTSD at some point, Women are about twice as likely as men to develop PTSD. And very sadly, the suicide of a US military veteran or service person occurs approximately once per hour. My research focuses on trying to figure out how we can rid the brain of the influence of these traumatic memories. And I use rats to try to figure out how to do that. So I expose the rats to a combination of a tone which sounds kind of like a whistle and a painful electric shock, which serves as a sort of traumatic event for the rat. And after a few of these tone shock pairings, the rat learns to be afraid of the tone, even when it's presented to them without the electric shock. However, if I continue to play the tone to the rat over and over and over again without the electric shock, the rat should eventually stop being afraid of the electric of, uh, of the tone as it learns that the tone is no longer predicting anything dangerous like the electric shock. 
Some rats are better at this than others, just like some humans can more easily let go of those traumatic memories while others continue to re-experience the trauma. For my thesis, I looked for differences between the brains of rats which were good at getting rid of that traumatic memory and rats which were bad at getting rid of that traumatic memory. And I found that in rats which were bad at getting rid of the traumatic memory, there was increased activity in a particular area of the brain called the paraventricular thalamus. This brain area is kind of like a relay station in the brain. It sends and receives messages to and from many different areas of the brain. So I see in this area that there's increased activity among the rats struggling to get rid of the traumatic memories. So there seems to be an association between activity in this area and failure to get rid of those traumatic memories, suggesting that if we could decrease activity in this brain area, we could help those rats get rid of the traumatic memory. Hopefully future work can figure out how to decrease activity in this brain area for humans suffering from PTSD and help them get rid of their traumatic memories as well. I hope that by identification of this brain area showing increased activity in the rats struggling to get rid of the traumatic memories that I can contribute to the larger picture of helping to treat people with this debilitating condition. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Amanda. That was great. Um, let's see. Our next speaker, before we pull him up, I would just like to give a quick reminder to our audience, if you're just now tuning in, that we are going to have a voting portion for the audience for the People's Choice Award. So just be on the lookout for that link. So with that, our third speaker is Zared Shaver. And if you'd like to go ahead and pull up his slides. So Zared studies cognitive science as a part of the psychology program. And his talk today is titled, Can Mysteries Change How You Think? Go ahead. Oh, wait. Got it. Think about a time when someone promised you, I got you this great gift and I can't wait to give it to you. If this has happened to you, then you've experienced exactly what I study. There's something in this box and you really wanna know what it is. This is just one example of the countless everyday mysteries that stem from moments in which it becomes clear to you that there's something you don't know. These mysteries are everywhere in all different flavors, shapes, and sizes, from those three dots that disappear when someone stops typing a message to you, to why did she never call me back, to you don't know my middle name. These mysteries can grab onto our attention and hold them captive and cause you to think differently and dwell even for seconds, minutes, maybe even years in some circumstances. It's a fundamentally human experience. And yet, psychologists have conducted almost no research to understand this experience. And that's where I come in. I address two basic and foundational questions about how people think about mysteries, because my job as a psychologist is to explain how people think. And I cannot complete my job and without a proper accounting for how people think about metaphors. Mystery, sorry. Uh, my, the first question I address is what kinds of mysteries will grab onto people, for which I think there's an obvious answer. Unsolved mysteries. Obvious, but not at all trivial when you consider the different experiences between unsolved and solved mysteries. You see, here's a gift that you're going to have to wait for versus here's a gift. It's a check for $25. Spend it in good health. Same starting point. Two vastly different paths you can take from it. And then the question becomes, when do people think about mysteries? Because psychologists need to explain when and in what specific situations people will think about them, for which I use a technique that's essentially mind reading to show when people think about mysteries. Here, I'll show you how. Did I say the word name earlier? 
If you said yes, then congratulations. You made your way back in memory to that mystery, what is my middle name? And it's really the speed at which you answer this question that's informative. Because you see, if you're actively thinking about something, then it's going to be right on the tip of your tongue when I ask you for that memory and you respond very quickly. And using this mind reading memory technique, I, I found that people tend to keep thinking about unsolved mysteries more so than the solved ones. And there's still quite a lot to learn about how people think about and experience mysteries. And if I've done my job well here, then maybe after today, you'll spend just a little bit of time wondering about these yet unsolved psychological mysteries yourself. Amazing, thank you. So we're gonna give the judges just an extra pause and recognize I'm going a little quickly. So I'm just gonna take a second here before we introduce our next, our next speaker. So as we slowly start to, uh, to move forward, our next speaker, speaker number four, is Kong Yu. So if the judges would also like to pin Kong Liu on, onto your screen, that is an option as well. Okay, so um, I am very excited to uh, introduce to everyone Kong Liu, who is from the chemistry department, my department as well. Um, and he is going to be talking to you today about speed up searching for needles in a haystack. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. How many of you guys have been taking the vaccine already? I wish at this point, you guys have all been vaccinated. Finding the vaccines for COVID was amazingly fast. It took only a year. However, what if you get the disease? Then you will need a drug. A vaccine won't help you once you have the disease. But discovering drug is much slower than finding vaccines. Today, that can take years. So why drug discovery is slow and how can we speed it up? It's hard because the virus has millions of atoms moving in very complex ways. Understanding those movements for drug discovery and use it to design small molecule drugs to control it takes more supercomputer time than it is available today. The hardest part of these problems boils down to finding needles. That is the key viral movement that enable it infecting human cells from a haystack. That is millions of atoms in the virus could be moving. To tackle these problems, I developed this new supercomputer method called MELD that can speed up this searching of needles in a haystack. Imagine right now, you are asked to find needles in a haystack. That's difficult, right? Because there are so many possible places where the needles could be. However, if I give you some hints, for example, there's a red strap attaching to the needles. Or for viral cases, the red proteins on the viral surface play a key role for it entering into human cell, then we can just zoom in and focus our search to those places and uncover important viral movements. Hopefully this can inspire us to design the magic small molecule drugs to fully stop it. 
traditionally, this is done in wet lab and it can take months, if not years. With this method, we can nail it down in weeks. These tools can dramatically speed up the small molecule drug discovery process and it can be used to fight COVID-19 and future pandemics. Thank you. Thank you, that was wonderful. That was great. All of these are so great so far. The audience is gonna have a very difficult time. People's choice, tough. Um, okay, I'll give it just, just a little pause for our judges as well. Um, our next finalist is going to be Chun Hao Pan. So if the judges would like to find Chun Hao Pan and, and pin onto, your, onto the Zoom. So, let's make sure uh, Chun Hao is all ready. So Chun Hao is from the Molecular and Cellular Biology Department. And his talk today is targeting keratin-17 in pancreatic cancer, a therapeutic window opens. Imagine you're a kid and here are two pools on the playground. Which one you would like to jump in? I like the Tiffany blue one because that's my favorite color. We all have our own personal preferences and so do cancer cells. Therefore, to understand what cancer cells like and who they really are is an important step to take good care of patients. My research focuses on pancreatic cancer which the survival rates has not improved over the past 40 years. So what makes pancreatic cancer such a terrible disease? Here's the clue from the clinic. Even with the same treatment, some patients respond and live, but some don't and die. My question is why they have different outcomes. These can be explained by the diversity of tumors. Let's pretend these two pools are tumors from two different patients. The shape of them looks exactly the same, but the composition of them is actually quite different. In this case, those pink balls could be the bad factors that make tumor cells more aggressive and become resistant to therapy and put patients in the worst condition. We believe that cancer cells are highly diverse at the molecular level, and it is unique in terms of what therapies they are sensitive to. To classify tumors to different categories, my goal is to look for the back factors that make tumor cell more aggressive and search for the therapy to target these aggressive cells. Our team has found a protein which expresses in tumors from those patients who had extremely short survival. This protein is called keratin-17. It is normally produced in our skin or hair, but very strangely in some cancer cells we were able to develop a test to detect keratin-17 as a biomarker to highlight those tumors with more aggressive manners. In addition, I found that keratin-17 actually makes a cancer cell become a super cell where it doesn't take in drugs anymore, so it is very hard to kill them. Luckily, I was able to find a new drug that can block the function of keratin-17 and make these aggressive cells vulnerable and sensitive to the therapy. More importantly, extended the survival of mice who had keratin-17 expressing tumors. In this three minutes of my talk, more than four people representing all corners of the world have been told you have pancreatic cancer. We hope that by detecting keratin-17 and assigning with this new treatment, this new approach can lead us to the day when we will be able to say to the patient, we know your tumor and we know how to best target it. Thank you. Thank you, Chun Hao, that was excellent. Up next, we will slowly start to move forward and introduce our sixth speaker. 
So our sixth speaker is Sarah Santos, and she is from the English department. If you'd like to go ahead and share your slide. All right, great. So again, this is Sarah Santos and she will be giving a talk titled Living in the End of the World. Thank you. Let's imagine the following apocalyptic scenarios. A highly contagious disease breaks out across the globe, turning all who are infected into brain-eating zombies. Yum. A nuclear war wipes out 80% of all life on Earth. Or maybe a chemical spill contaminates water, soil, and air, causing the death of thousands. Wait, back up. That's not an apocalyptic scenario. That actually happened. In fact, it's the inspiration for uh, interest in Ha's novel, Animals People. On the night of December 2nd, 1984, a technical failure at an American pesticide plant in Bhopal, India, caused a leak of deadly toxins that killed between 5,000 and 10,000 people almost immediately. And that over the course of the last 36 years has continued to severely debilitate thousands more. To this day, the survivors represented in the bottom photo still live with terribly debilitating conditions. And children are born with birth defects, uh, mental disabilities and speech disorders. So my project asked the following question, what counts as an apocalypse? Must an apocalyptic story be ever looking forward towards a terrifying ending? Or is it possible that for some, the apocalypse has already happened, that it happens on a daily basis? With this as one of my many guiding questions, I looked at dystopian and apocalyptic literature to think about and understand the lived experiences of those deemed politically, economically, biologically less than human. For many communities, life in the 21st century is apocalyptic. And through this image of the people of the apocalypse and literature from authors of color from across the world, I think about what it means to be human in our global community and how we may harness these fictional narratives in order to reclaim the lived experiences of the real communities. And what I have found is that the human is anything but a simple or neutral term. In fact, the human is often associated with Western white able bodies so that the vulnerable bodies of color of the Bhopalis or of the victims of the 2010 earthquake in Haiti and of those asphyxiated to death by white policemen in 2020 America, they become different, less worthy of protection, less human. Ultimately, the problem of what it means to be human in the 21st century forces us to grapple with who we have been, who we are, and who we are in the process of becoming as a global community. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. That's so great. We're getting just a huge um, spectrum of a lot of different types of types of theses. This is wonderful. Um, so we have, we have two talks left, and I just want to remind everyone again, in case you're just tuning in, that um, we are going to have our three judges um, determining the top three panelists, as well as the uh, People's Choice Award. So be sure to pick your favorite and vote. Um, so up next, we have our speaker number seven, who is Chiaoning Wu. And Chiaoning, if you'd like to go ahead and present your slide. So Chiaoning is from the Department of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences. And today she will be talking on ocean memories of hurricanes. Thanks. Do you still remember Hurricane Sandy from the year 2012? That's almost nine years ago. Hurricanes like Sandy leave a dent in our memories and our lives, and as, uh, along with the trail of uh, destructions everywhere they go. Around the world, tropical storms just like Sandy are the leading cause of damage and death globally, 
affecting billions of people. And because these storms draw their energy from churning up the ocean water and affecting the temperatures underneath, they also leave a dent in the ocean, which can last a long time after the storm has passed. In other words, the ocean can remember hurricanes just as we do. And as this uh, effect on the ocean temperature persists for weeks or months or even beyond the year, they can potentially affect the, the, the storms that, uh, that form in the same season or later. But as you can probably imagine, these effects are difficult to study for observation because it's hard to observe the ocean under hurricane conditions. In order to take a closer look at the ocean, my research uses simplified climate models. This type of models are like digital siblings of our planet, but where the ocean covers the world globally, providing a bigger petri dish in which to grow hurricanes, where they interact with the ocean in the same manner as they do in the Atlantic or the Pacific. And where the, uh, in these models, the, the atmosphere and the ocean are divided into millions of uh, little pixels. And I use a supercomputer to calculate what happens in each of these grids in order to get a global picture. Um, in this way, I was able to look at hundreds of storms at different strengths. When we look at hurricanes over the ocean, in many ways, they are like a drill that turns up the ocean water and draws out the energy and altering the ocean temperature underneath. Weaker storms are like weaker drills and they have a shallower effect. As the ocean warms and cools with the season, these shallower effects are more or less taken away within that seasonal cycle. However, strong hurricanes of category four or five are like really powerful drills that punches the hole down into the underwater temp temperature structure of, uh, of thousands of feet or hundreds of meters, which is much deeper than the seasonal cycle. And it is this, this effect carried around by the background current that might affect the hurricanes that come next or even beyond the annual cycle. Having better understanding of these processes would contribute to better models and tools for prediction. As we remember disasters of the past, our understanding of ocean memories will help protect us from disasters of the future. Thank you. Thank you, that was great. That was so great. So we are now coming up to last but not least. Um, before we start, um, I will let the audience know that, that the People's Choice Award voting period will only be for 10 minutes, so be ready. And so with that, I would love to introduce Shruti. Shruti Ayer is from the genetics department. And today she will be talking on solving genetic puzzles to understand cancer. Thank you. Why can't we cure cancer? Well, we can't cure something if we don't fully understand it. And we can't understand something if we're not using the best possible tools to study it. DNA sequencing is the tool us geneticists use to look at someone's DNA and try and find the faults in that DNA to see how they relate to the emergence of cancer. Now, there are two main types of DNA sequencing. Let's call them short and long. The short approach has been around for decades, and it involves breaking down your DNA into really tiny pieces, examining each piece to find faults in them, and then putting these pieces together to see how these faults relate with one another in causing cancer. Now, what if a fault isn't small enough to fit in a tiny puzzle piece? What if it spans several puzzle pieces? Well, now it's like trying to put together a thousand piece puzzle that has a lot of mistakes and no one's given you the box to refer to. It's this sort of problem that the long approach helps circumvent. The long approach breaks down your DNA into much larger chunks, giving you a clearer idea of that DNA and the faults in that DNA from the get-go. Now, the problem with the long approach is that it's fairly new and this makes it more expensive and less flexible to use it for a wide range of applications. This is where my work comes in. What I help do is make the long approaches faster, cheaper, more accurate, and more efficient 
so that we can use it to study thousands of cancer patients to really try and find these faults that are driving cancer. One of the ways I do this is by using chemicals that work like scissors and label makers to narrow down our areas of focus. Now, scientists have found that there are specific parts of our DNA that strongly correlate with cancer, but we don't know the faults in these regions that clearly. So say you're interested in looking at the American flag from this puzzle. You wanna find faults in that flag. You wanna see if the stars and the stripes are in, in the right order, the right number, orientation, etc. Do you really wanna waste your time then solving the entire puzzle when you only care about a few pieces? No, right? So this is what I help do. Using the scissor chemicals, I cut around the parts of the DNA that we care about. And using the label makers, I help mark those parts of DNA that we don't care about so that we can pull them out of our reaction. We're now using our time and our resources more efficiently because we're narrowing down what we're looking at, allowing us to use these extra resources and our time and effort to look at the same regions across thousands and thousands of patients. This really helps us tease apart the different faults that are in the DNA and find out which faults are really driving cancer. So essentially, my work is helping solve cancer by looking at one large puzzle piece at a time. Thank you. I loved all of those so much. Thank you to all of our wonderful eight final speakers um, and everyone else who participated this year in the three minute thesis competition. Um, we are now going to, and of course to, to all of the organizers um, of this program, we are now going to shift into um, the next portion of the program. And before that, I would like to just now, I've said it multiple times at this point, we are going to be opening up um, this portion to the People's Choice Award. And so the link that you need to go and vote is this bit.ly link that we have showing right here, um, bit.ly slash 3MT 2021 vote. You can also just quickly scan this QR code if that works for you as well. So votes will only be open for the next 10 minutes. So please go in and, and cast your vote for your favorite three minute thesis. Um, and with that, I will now hand it over to our the next moderator, Dr. Alfreda James. Um, Dr. Alfreda James is the Assistant Director of the Graduate Career Services uh, within the Career Center. And so with that, um, Alfreda, I'll give it over to you. Thank you very much. You know, this is probably one of the best days in the spring semester, even under circumstances like this because we're gathered here together and we're talking about the future. We are nurturing a future when we work together on programs like 3MT, future interviews, future promotions and hires. We've had PhD alumni come to campus recently or at virtual events and each speaker has talked about the need to develop and practice communication skills before entering the job market. 3MT has become an essential stage in training for graduate students, for, especially for PhD students. So yes, while this event is a competition, it's also a collaboration between departments and faculty who make unique contribute investments in the future. So let's take a few minutes to acknowledge the people in our lives who help us today that will eventually provide us with opportunities to advance tomorrow. So I'd like to take the time to personally thank the Career Center staff, the Alumni Association, my peers in the graduate school, and faculty for continuing to invest in 3MT and this career competency of communication. Again, this is all about the future of our students and something that everyone understands that we have to offer in order to secure that future. So at this point, I would like to call on the speakers to spend some time acknowledging the individuals who have helped them get to this point in time. And in terms of order, we will start with our first speaker from physics and astronomy. If you would unmute yourself and uh, 
and uh, show your video to uh, acknowledge who's helped you to get to, to today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So I would like to thank the event organizers and especially Katie and Paula who were great and they helped us so much with the talks, with the slides and the training sessions, which were truly enjoyable. They were the best part of it all. Uh, so thank you, Katie and Paula. I would also like to thank my thesis advisor, Professor Marivi Panandasara, who is just the best advisor ever. And she has been an excellent mentor to me throughout my PhD. To my research group, the physics department, the ISCS community, and of course, the, the judges and the audiences who were there listening to all our talks today. Thank you. All right, next up, Amanda Russo from Integrative Neuroscience. Hi everyone. I'd like to say thank you first to my advisor, Dr. Brian Parsons, uh, for six years of support and mentorship throughout my PhD. Um, I'd also like to thank all of the members of my lab, uh, particularly Kahinde Cole. She's another PhD student in the lab who helped me with some of the experiments in my dissertation. Um, I'd also like to thank, again, all of the organizers of the event, everyone who makes 3MT happen, and uh, particularly Katie and Paula. They really helped us hone these talks and get them down to three minutes. And uh, like the previous speaker said, it was really a lot of fun. Um, and I'd also, again, like to thank the audience, the judges, and all of the other competitors for sharing their work. It was really a fun experience getting to know everyone and, and seeing their talks. Thank you. You're welcome. Gerard? Yeah, thanks, Alfreda. Uh, I'll, I'll start with thanking uh, you and Katie and Paula and everybody who's been involved with uh, Three Minute Thesis. I've been helping out on the uh, making it happen side for a couple of years. And so it's really good um, to sit here on the competing side, uh, finally. Um, I especially would like to thank uh, Richard Gehrig, my doctoral advisor, he's taught me so very much about how to think about how people think and to look at the world and, uh, and pull interesting and new questions and to tease apart the smallest little moments um, to think about how psychology bears on them. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, also thank my incredibly patient wife uh, for helping me through um, thesis writing the last uh, last five years. And uh, of course, my uh, tiny son, who's I guess not so tiny anymore, um, who is an endless joy, even when he is shaking the table as I'm trying to uh, do all of my writing and thinking and whatever else it might be. So uh, thank you to all those distractions. Fantastic. OK, uh, Kang Lu from Chemistry, you're next. Yes, so I would like to first thank uh, Katie and Paula and all my peers during the three minutes training sessions for their helpful suggestions. And they really helped me to carve out these uh, presentations. And second, I would like to thank my uh, PhD advisor, Professor Kendu, and all my group mates, especially my colleague, Dr. Emiliano Brini. He's a person who urged me and pushed me to participate into this uh, three minutes synthesis. So for him, I owe a big thanks. And also I would like to thank all my, uh, all the residents in Luffer Center and all my uh, friends in chemistry and physics department and all the finalists that compete uh, with me today and uh, all the people who come to the events. Thank you. Wonderful. Next up is Chun Hao Pan, Molecular and Cellular Biology. Yes, um, thank you very much. And I really want to appreciate every organizers that helped to make this three minutes thesis happen. And especially during this difficult time that we have to do this in virtual because last year I was trying to get to the competition, but then the COVID hits and I have to volunteer to do some tests. So I was not able to make it last time. But this is really nice that we came up with this alternative tool based on our passion of communicating, sharing our works. And this really helped us to get together to share our own passions in communicating our science. And I also want to thank to my advisors, Dr. Shoyer and Dr. Escobar Hoyos. They helped me a lot by not just doing science, especially when we have to present our data and how to simplify our findings and how to communicate our findings to the public, because this is what we care for. And this is how I think we think we have to approach to the public to let people know that 
we're doing important things and we're sharing our findings and we that help the community. So thanks everyone to here during this event and also the peers during the training session. Thank you, Sarah Santos from the Department of English. So I, I wanna first thank my, my committee, um, which is comprised of professors Johnston, Santana and Thompson in the English department. Um, I mean, just they've been like the most like supportive uh, kind of source of, of just knowledge and everything throughout the last few years and really helped me, um, you know, like shape, help shape my, my thinking and shape this you know, 200 page beast of a dissertation um, uh, that I'm that I'm tackling and thinking about these texts. Um, uh, Professor Johnston, he's particularly to blame for everything uh, that I presented today. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, major shout out to my fellow PhD, English PhDs, Caitlin and John, who are in the first round, uh, who gave phenomenal talks. Um, and just a shout out to everyone who participated in the 3MT because everyone's talks were just so interesting um, and I just learned so much. Um, and finally, thank you to Paola and, and Katie uh, for being just really fantastic coaches. Um, it's really hard to boil this down to three minutes and still make it comprehensible, uh, but you really pushed me to crystallize my argument in my talk and, and that was really that was really valuable. Thank you. Fantastic acknowledgments there. Uh, ocean memories of hurricanes, please. Ms. Wu. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here. And uh, I'd like to especially say thanks to my thesis co-advisors, uh, Drs. Kevin Reed and Christopher Wu from the SOMAS, um, who have been supportive of my participation in this uh, competition, despite everything else that needs to happen in this graduation season. And I would also like to thank my uh, research mentors at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, Drs. Um, Scott Lachman, uh, Gustavo Marquez, and Frank Bryan, who have uh, uh, patient me, patiently guided me through a lot of the uh, challenging research questions. And additionally, I'd also like to uh, say that I uh, um, and I, I, I am thankful for the support from the, and the Institute of uh, um, Advanced Computational Science at Stony Brook for supporting my thesis research project uh, and for the ELDA Center for providing uh, a many opportunities of uh, science communication training that I have received and also to a, a group of friends that I have uh, fortunately across uh, a few disciplines and institutes who, who really helped me craft my talk. And uh, last, but certainly not, not least, a big shout out to the organizers, Katie and uh, Paula for providing all these uh, uh, amazing uh, training sessions. And uh, I am also uh, humbled and honored to be within this uh, outstanding cohort where everybody has given phenomenal talks and we have been most supportive of each other through this uh, very special year of competition. Thank you all. Fantastic. And certainly uh, Shruti Iyer from Genetics, Hi, so I'd like to first start out by thanking all of the members in my lab who have been so supportive and nurturing uh, to a grad student, especially my advisor, Dick McCombie, who will never stop me from participating in the craziest things just so that I can hone my communication skills. I'd like to thank my home program at Stony Brook and especially uh, the genetics program uh, director, Martha Fury and Jen who like really keep our uh, program working. And it's, I may be biased, but it's one of the best programs to be in. Um, I'd especially like to thank my thesis committee because they've been instrumental in helping me grow as a scientist. Anything that I present, of course, they've helped shape it. Uh, a special shout out to what I'd like to call my 3MT family. Katie and Paula have been amazing in just helping us distill our message and find what's important from the pages and pages of work that we have churned out. I'd like to thank all of my fellow uh, participants. Your feedback during all of our training sessions have just been amazing. And I think we've all helped each other get here today. A special shout out to uh, my science communication instructors at um, Allen Alda Center, uh, Julia, Nancy, and E. Beth, who have been really helpful in me getting here today. Uh, and I'd also like to thank my family who are particularly enjoying Zoom formats now because they can tune in from India. 
my sister, who's one of my biggest cheerleaders, and my parents, who even though it's 3 a.m. in India, I know that they're watching right now. So thank you to everyone who's been a part of making me who I am today. That's fantastic. You know, we are all here because of the support of someone. Sometimes the someone is in the United States, other times a, on a totally different continent. I'd like to also let you know that there's another future investment here. I will use these videos during career coaching sessions with graduate students. Whenever anyone says to me, oh, I will never, or oh, I can't do that, or when they say they can't, I will then whip out one of these videos and I'll say, there's a PhD student distilling a message in three minutes. You can do it. When people tell me, oh, but I've never, I will, this is, this is cannon fodder. This is great material for future career coaching sessions. I've been able to use this material for years and it's fantastic. So before I hand the event over to the announcements, I again would like to thank you all from the bottom of my heart for your willingness to do this, for your good humor and for your persistence. It hasn't been easy. In fact, at times it's been hell, but you've done it and that is worthy of recognition. So at this point, I'm going to turn the program back over to Katie and the, annou and the announcement uh, from the, the award announcement from the president of the Alumni Association. Take it over, Katie. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Alfreda, thank you so much to our competitors for all your kind words. Um, we're definitely getting to that part of the program where um, we're going to have to choose winners, but honestly, I just think that the talks were so amazing. Um, now that I think we've finally gotten into the groove with our model of 3MT, um, you know, I, it, it almost feels like the talks just keep getting better and and better and better every year. And so I'm, I'm so pleased to hear that our students are feeling that this is a, a skill that they're gonna be able to take out into so many different aspects of their career. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm delighted that now they have a nice three minute talk in their back pocket that can help them explain what they do to whoever they talk to next. They have a nice YouTube video that they can link in their signatures. And so hopefully it'll help them all get jobs and it'll help them all with the next step. Um, so moving into the next phase, I, I wanted to take a, a very short step back and I want to broaden my remarks to really embrace the entire competition and all 26 competitors that we had. Um, this is the largest group that we've had participate in 3MT. As I think some of you heard um, a little bit about from the remarks from our competitors, the model that we use, um, you know, we are of course blessed to have the Alda Center for Communicating Science here at Stony Brook. Um, I've been an instructor with them and so I've been using that model for the coaching that our students undergo each year. And part of the magic of that model is that it's cohort based. So all of the individualized coaching we do on each of their talks, the students are coaching and supporting each other. And inevitably every year there's an aha moment of of amazing synergies that are cross disciplines between two different projects where one of the competitors will say, oh, that's what I do too. You should go before me and our talk should be together. Um, and, and, and inevitably those moments keep happening over and over again. And so um, the last couple of weeks have been, are really the most enjoyable for me. Um, seeing these final versions is, I'm, I'm, I'm just so very proud of how well you've all done. And so I just want to, um, I'm gonna show you a quick video so that we can recognize everyone who's participated in this process and then we will go into the award ceremony. So let me share my screen one more time. And we'll watch a little three minute video.
turned out so nice. So um, again, you know, such an amazing, uh, amazing representation from so many departments, from so many students, such amazing videos. I just want to remind everybody out there that all the round one videos are available. They are posted on the grad school YouTube channel and you can see them at stonybrook.edu slash 3MT where the live stream is taking place. Um, they're linked just right below. So I encourage you all to go watch all the videos if you do get a chance. Um, but you know, drum roll please. We're now going to move into talking about who won the top prizes amongst our eight competitors. So um, Academy Award style, um, I would like to ask our eight finalists to go ahead and turn your video cameras on and we're going to go into gallery mode. Um, excellent, here we all are and I'm going to go into uh, into my file. Okay, excellent. So again, amazing hard work from so many of you. Um, I wanna give prizes to everyone because I know how hard you've worked and I think all of your talks are really so amazing. But first we're going to learn who won third place in 3MT 2021 is huh, a tie. That so often happens to us these days. So, um, when we have a tie, when we have a tie, that means we're going to recognize both of both of our speakers, and we're going to figure out all the prizes and the money things after the fact. Um, so instead, I'm going to I'm going to read your names alphabetically. So our first third place winner is Shruti Iyer from Genetics for her talk on solving genetic puzzles to understand cancer. So virtual clap, everyone, virtual clap. So congratulations, Shruti. Um, our other second third place winner is Amanda Russo from Integrative Neuroscience in the Psychology Department for her talk on getting rid of traumatic memories. So virtual clap. Congratulations, Amanda and Shruti. Um, and, you know, inevitably ties keep happening each year. We may have to have a better process for this in the future. I think at the end of the day, and, and I imagine our judges can confirm this, it's getting harder and harder to judge these things. So I don't know, we might need to somehow make it harder and like, you know, introduce like walking over hot coals or something while you have to give your talk because they're all doing just too good of a job. Um, all right, now we're gonna move on to second place. Our second place winner this year is Sarah Santos from English for her talk on living in the end of the world. Congratulations, Sarah. Okay, so because people's choice inevitably always ends up being also our first or second place winner, we decided to mix it up a little bit and we're now gonna do people's choice before we do first place. Um, that's just what we decided to do this year. Maybe we'll do it different next year. But so now people's choice. So this is the talk that everyone who was watching at home or from their offices or through the live stream, um, hopefully all of you got a chance to vote for yourself because that's totally within the rules. Um, so people's choice is the one that the general audience really liked the most. And our People's Choice winner this year is Sarah Santos from the English Department. Congratulations, Sarah. Virtual clap. Virtual, I'm the only one who's making noise. I'm sorry, I should be much louder about that. Virtual clap. Okay, and so finally, first place um, for best talk at Three Minute Thesis for 2021. Um, who interestingly enough was going to be one of our competitors last year and had to devote his time to the COVID-19 pandemic, Chen Ho Pan from the Molecular and Cellular Biology Program for his talk on targeting keratin 17 and pancreatic cancer, a therapeutic window opened. 
So congratulations to Hope. Um, and congratulations to everyone, fantastic talks. Um, thank you so much to our judges. Thank you to so much to our viewers. Thank you so much to our supporters. Extra thank you to all of the thesis advisors who, who gave such great mentoring and support to all of our students and the amazing research that we heard today. Um, and, you know, we'll be here again next year, same bad time, same bad channel for a three minute thesis 2022. Um, students go off into the world, graduate, do great work, do great scholarship and use your skills. Thank you so much everyone for being at 3MT 2021 this year. Katie, before you sign off, would you please give Dr. Goldbart the opportunity to respond to what he's just seen? Because he barely knows us. <laughs> this is introduction. Not to put you on the spot or anything. <laughs> um, happy to be put on the spot. Thank you. Um, look, I never had any doubts about joining this wonderful community. Uh, but if I had had doubts, they would have been erased by uh, this afternoon's activities. I think folks did a splendid, splendid job. And as I often feel at events like this, panel discussions and so forth with our students, undergraduate and graduate, uh, the world is in good hands. So thank you very much, everybody. Enjoy and uh, celebrate wisely. Bye-bye. And thank you, Alfreda. <laughs> thank you, Katie. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Paul. That was wonderful. Um, so I'm going to uh, officially close our event right now, but I would like to keep all of our finalists for a moment so we could take a few more, I'm going to call them photos. <laughs> So long, everybody. See you soon, I hope.